Okay, so today's session, um, as Barbara's already mentioned, is actually part of a series. Um, the Cochrane Rapid Review Methods Group have undertaken a series of guidance papers and um, there's a list there of the topics that have been covered in previous um, um, editions, and these are being published in BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine. But the last two sessions are focusing on the application of rapid approaches to specific types of evidence synthesis. So two weeks ago, Andrew Booth looked at qualitative evidence synthesis, and today we're looking at rapid scoping reviews. So previous sessions will be extremely relevant still, but we're thinking about the application of these processes in to these specific evidence synthesis types. Our publication um, is still in progress and hopefully that will be available soon. Although I'm presenting today, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, the other colleagues who are working on this publication with me. I think one of the um, problems with the term rapid review is that although it implies there's something different from standard review approaches and something that's increased the speed of the review, it doesn't tell us anything about what type of evidence synthesis approach has been used. And I really think that we should be moving towards including that in our description of the review. So here we're talking about rapid scoping reviews. And the reasons for that is that some of the processes in these different types of review may be different in terms of their um, time resource. Um, and it may be that rapid approaches might impact those reviews, um, the way that they're done and their output slightly differently. And in this session today, I'm just going to be focusing specifically on the process of question formulation, searching, data extraction and reporting in scoping reviews. And I just wanted to start, um, for those of you who are perhaps not familiar with um, rapid reviews, but to start with this definition from the Cochrane Rapid Review Methods Group. And it's a definition that's really, we've seen these definitions evolve over time. I'll just give you a moment just to read that through. There are several elements of that definition that I really want to highlight because they're very relevant in a rapid context. And one is the very close working that you do with your commissioners. And they may be um, involve a range of knowledge users, but your commissioner will be usually thinking about how that rapid review is going to be applied in a particular context. They're very tailored to support a specific decision. And the other thing that I just wanted to highlight too, and this is something that we talk very much about in our rapid reviews course, is that actually we've got a suite of tools that actually rapid approaches are not one size fits all. And that sort of idea that you've come along today and will go away with a clear sense of exactly how to do a rapid scoping review isn't the case. Actually, it's there's a range of different approaches that might be used to um, speed up the time it takes to undertake a scoping review. And that the other thing is that they still adhere to principles of rigor and transparency. Um, and so that all of the methods in a rapid um, process should be very clearly defined. One of the things that you will often see when you read about the methods for scoping reviews is that there's a lot of variation in the way these terms are used. And one of the things I just wanted to start off, because some of you might come along today thinking this is going to be talking about this very rapid approach that's sometimes used um, to describe the kind of groundwork that you might do before you start a review, the type of work that you might be doing um, you, in close collaboration, hopefully with your information specialist to identify what might be some of the key terms you'd use in your search, what's going to be the scale of the project to get a sense of how long it's going to take you. And also to find out, has some has a review already been done in this area? Is there something in progress? Is there a, a protocol registered to avoid um, um, research waste um, and to just to give you a sense of guiding you forwards and sometimes um, I often hear people talk about a rapid scoping search and actually what they're meaning is this process beforehand and I just want to um, if you've come along today thinking that that's what it's going to be about um, actually we're not going to be talking very much about that um, but I did want to just um, 
introduce the, some of these resources. If that's if that's what you're thinking, this is um, these uh, in those kind of situations. One of your greatest friends are going to be existing systematic reviews and protocols, and those in the blue box are those that are very much are those with a, a health um, orientation. So to look for existing systematic reviews, obviously you've got the Cochrane Library. Another really nice um, database is the Epistemonicus database um, of existing systematic reviews, the TRIP database, Centre Reviews and Dissemination. Those other ones at the bottom um, won't have a health focus so much. So the Campbell Library, obviously, um, if you're looking for reviews, reviews in international development, education, social welfare and so on environmental sciences and obviously Prospero um, a site for people will register their protocols so these are going to be your friends if, if that's what you're looking at your very rapid piece of work that's going to prepare for um, a subsequent review and we often see that so this is a, a, a lovely diagram that I wanted to include from Sandy, Sandy Oliver um, and it's looking at um, actually the, it really highlights the integration. This is a two-stage process to a rapid review, but really illustrates very nicely the importance of this stakeholder engagement right at the beginning. And they highlight this need for the scoping, scoping the literature. So that's that's what I refer to when I mention um, that process. But it's slightly different to what we think about when we think about a scoping review in the context which I'm going to be spending more time thinking about this morning. And here's a, a definition um, from Zachary Munn. Scoping reviews are a type or evidence synthesis aiming to systematically identify and map the breadth of evidence available on a particular topic, field, context or issues, or often irrespective of source within or across particular context. So just again, this idea that it's a systematic process, that it's rigorous, exhaustive, transparent, this idea that it's covering a breadth, not a narrow um, question about a specific type of intervention, about whether it works or not, but actually to look across a broad area. And that might be interventions, that might be exposures, that might be a, a concept, for example, infertility. Um, and also, it's likely to draw on a range of different types of evidence, not always, but usually a range of different types of evidence. So let's think about a particular example. Um, you may be um, a policymaker in the context where you're aware of a growing number of children in school, your local schools with poor mental health um, and well-being, growing levels of anxiety. And you may have a there may be a number of different questions that you might ask. Would a mindful intervention work for children in our school? I wonder what children and their parents feel might be the best solutions. I would really like to know what different types of interventions have been developed and tried in schools like ours. So you could be asking a range of different types of questions in respect of the problem that you're facing. And of course, it's that final one that would be appropriate for adopting a scoping review. So there are many situations and we're seeing an increasing use of these types of approaches to support decision making because we can think of many situations where actually just looking at a specific intervention may not be very helpful. Sometimes actually a policymaker, a decision maker want to, might want to know about the range of interventions that are available. And one piece of um, work that I did, um, we're looking at um, reducing the risk of preterm birth. That's exactly what um, our knowledge users wanted. They were, didn't want to know about a specific intervention, but they wanted to know about a whole range of interventions that have been developed in LMIC contexts. Um, just an, uh, one of the things that I'm going to be doing this session is trying to point you towards tools that may be useful. And this is just a tool I wanted to recommend that if you're not sure whether um, a scoping review is the right approach to use, um, this is quite a nice tool that can help guide you, help you to think about actually what are the objectives of your review. And of course, in the, a rapid, any review context, but particularly in a rapid review context, usually when you're going to be delivering something to a decision maker within a short time frame to support a decision within a short time frame, you want to be very clear on what your questions are and your objectives are. 
the other um the other thing that's really important in any rapid approach and and scoping reviews are no different is that you have a good idea of what your reference guidance is. How far is that rapid approach moving away from the recommended guidance for that particular evidence synthesis approach you've used? And I've got some the key sort of the key methodological work that people refer to. So Alexian O'Malley and Levac, and also um, some methodological papers that come from JBI methods groups. Um, so key methods references that um, you should be very familiar with. And often um, some of the, re the we recommend that if you're going to be undertaking a rapid approach, that actually you need to have good expertise in what the standard approach, the gold standards are, in order to really be able to understand to what extent you're modifying those approaches. And also to what extent those approaches are going to be impacting the generalizability um, and the rigor um, and the reliability of the output. And also, um, if you're going to be undertaking um, a rapid scoping review, also bearing in mind the PRISMA guidance for the reporting of those reviews would still, still apply. I'm including at the end of this session, there's a, a, some lists with all of the references. So all of these references um, are available on that as a resource for you. I also just wanted um, to, um, to introduce the idea of the big picture research family, review family. Um, scoping reviews are not the only approach that's available to us as reviewers to use when we're trying to to um, introduce or cover the breadth of a topic. Um, so we've also, and some of you may be familiar with mapping reviews, evidence gap maps, mega maps. And this is a, um, a, a, a visual that um, Sir Adam White um, created that I've modified. We can also see other types of other names appearing in the literature, focus scoping reviews, for example. And, and, and we've kind of, use the term big picture review to cover the this this collection of approaches um that um that we're seeing emerging and they're emerging because they have real value in supporting decision making um we've tried to um look in some more depth in these different types of um uh, different terminology and how they're used i don't want to spend very long on that today but just to introduce the idea that they're um, are a range of approaches for trying to um, to create a, and address broad research questions. Um, one of my colleagues um, in that work, um, Danielle Pollock, worked with JBR. They created this really nice visual based on that, and I hope a, a version of this will be in the in the in the paper that we produce on rapid scoping reviews. Um, but just to highlight this um, idea here now. This was a this is some proposed approaches for how we distinguish the difference within these types of methods that are addressing broad research questions. But the number of studies that you might see, and this has relevance a bit further on when we're looking at our processes of data extraction. But these types of approaches usually have a lot of studies, not always, but usually will have a large number of included studies. And that obviously has an impact in terms of the time that it's going to take to um, gather your data and to report it. I've tried to, um, I've, I've adapted a table that Kangaroo created some time ago to think about what are the very broad and generalized difference between a standard scoping review and a rapid review. In both approaches, you're going to need to have a team working together. And um, one of the, the, the papers in this series looks at team working. But in a rapid context, um, having an experienced team um, that are able to work quickly and closely together is particularly important with regular dialogue with commissioners. Again, some general ballpark timeframes. Now, obviously, um, these can always vary considerably, but a big picture review might take a, a, about a year. Um, and there are various estimates regarding how long things take, but I don't think that's an unreasonable length of time um, 
And certainly some of the evidence we have is that that's how long a big picture review can take. Um, whereas quite often um, a rapid approach um, might require that a, um, that a big picture review, a scope review, map review, gap maps done in considerably short of time frames. Um, often they, there is scope and a standard approach to, to, to address a range of questions, whereas in a rapid approach, the number of questions and specificity might be might, much tighter. We'd expect a standard approach to be exhaustive in terms of searching, whereas in a rapid approach, we'd expect to see some limitations. In the data extraction is likely to be much more in depth with a, a, an emphasis on thinking about knowledge generation rather than in a rapid context, this tailored approach to addressing specific commissioner needs. And it may be that actually rapid um, reviews may not always um, get published. They may, may remain in the grey literature. One thing that we're seeing is the increasing use of, of the phrase rapid scoping reviews. This is just looking at some results, looking at the use of that in titles. And I think that um, that's not only that we're seeing more and more scoping reviews taking place. I think some of this is relating to the, the impact of the, um, the PRISMA guidance and reporting. Um, Andrea Trico did, uh, and team did uh, a scoping review of scoping review processes and one of the things that um, that that review found was actually one of the the problems is quite often there is a lack of reporting, um, and so quite often say the process of title abstract screening twenty three percent these weren't reported the full text screening again often poorly reported and likewise the methods of data extraction, and I think that that's where we're seeing um, uh, the impact of the reporting guidance improving, and so when when uh, review teams are having to undertake a review in much shorter time frames, perhaps modify what our recommended approach approaches, um, we're seeing the the um, the evolution of, of the terminology, and so we're seeing the use of this this term more often. So it's important to think about well, when would you consider um, a rapid um, big picture approach? Well, obviously, there's urgent clinical scenarios, and one of those peaks in that graph I just showed you reflected the, the growth in the use of rapid approaches, rapid scoping approaches during COVID. Um, and in fact, we um, undertook a rapid scoping review um, and had a six week period to complete that piece of work. It may be that there are emergent issues, for example, um, the, the growing public health concerns around um, Internet gambling. Um, so it might not be an urgent clinical scenario. It might be a growing awareness that there's a new problem that needs um, um, policy decisions. One of the things that we always include in our rapid review course is the perspective of policymakers, that quite often they're working with very different time frames than those of us within the research community. And when you're working closely with your policymakers um, in in undertaking a, a review, it's understanding for them two weeks might be a very long time. Um, so just um, being aware of that and 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 cognizant of those those sort of time frames. And sometimes we see rapid review approaches adopted because there simply aren't uh, the resources to support, for, for example, the salary costs of a, a year's review. So though, those may be some of the reasons we might see a rapid big picture approach. And one of the things that we would um, encourage is that always there's a description, not just of the methods that have been used, but also the rationale for why um, those rapid approaches have been adopted. Whenever you're starting to think about undertaking a big picture review or scoping review, um, it's useful to, to know how long it's going to take, because if you're going to try and speed that process up, um, you really know, well, how long should it take? And that really helps when you're planning your team, allocating tasks and working with your commissioners. And again, just another tool that um, some of you might be aware of, um, the predictor tool, which is designed to really support um, helping to work out what the impact of different decisions are throughout the review process that can, um, that can be modified and might be able to speed 
things up. Now, just a heads up that this is a tool that is actually being currently worked on and developed, and there's plans to relaunch it um, at the Global Evidence Summit in September. Um, so it's it's under review, but um, nevertheless, it's still a really useful tool. And um, behind the tool uh, is quite a lot of data that was collected um, just to look at how long the different stages of the review process take. And on the left-hand side, you can see a graph looking at the different um, times of the different aspects of the review take. Um, and on the right-hand side, a systematic map. And and what um, and, and and I've put a red box around the screening time because it's very striking when you look at that figure, um, how much longer um, a systematic map might take. And I think this just underlines the fact that um, it's a misconception to think that a scoping review or mapping review or evidence gap map is a is a quick piece of work. They aren't the quicker pieces of work. They can take um, as long and sometimes longer than a systematic review. And that relates to the fact that actually you're dealing usually with much larger search results. Um, and and um, Hadaway and, and Westgate, when they were doing this work, found that on average, the number of um, results to screen in a, in, a, in, in a mapping review would be about 22,000 compared to 12,000 in, in a systematic review. So usually much larger quantities of results to screen through and also consequently code. And um, of course that screening process has got these two stages which you'd be having to document as you report your findings of title and abstract screening, full text screening. And this is just a, a slightly simplified picture of that graph that I showed you from Hadaway or based on the data from Hadaway and Westgate. And again, just highlighting the very great differences that we see when we're undertaking these type of big picture reviews um, in terms of the screening results and data extraction or data coding or charting. So these are two areas where these types of approaches are going to differ significantly to a systematic review that's looking at um, the effectiveness of an intervention. So when we're thinking about our rapid approaches in these types of reviews, we've got to be thinking, what can we do to manage that? That is going to be an enormous amount of our time. How are we going to approach that? And there's two things that, that um, you can start thinking about. First of all, one of them is to think about how do you reduce the search yield? What can you do to reduce that expected number of 22,000 to something that's going to be a little bit more manageable in the timeframes that you have. And also then once you've got your results, what might you do to be able to speed up that process of screening? And this is where actually that planning and having an understanding of how long things take is, a, is really useful because if you know how long something's going to take and you know how long you've got to do the review, you know how much you've got to reduce that time by. We like to think of our reviews as moving through these very defined stages where we define our question, we do our search, we go onto our screening and the nice little boxes. But certainly when we're thinking about um, big picture reviews, scoping reviews, uh, mapping reviews, evidence gap maps, there's often this um, much more iterative process um, where actually there's a certain amount of defining the question, doing a bit of searching, perhaps even starting screening and realizing that there needs to be further refining of that process. So although we might like to think they go in these very, and, and for purposes of rigor, defined stages, the reality is that quite often there's a certain amount of iteration around of these approaches. And there may need to be a little bit of um, going through. And in fact, when you read some of the literature around the methods, this goes and extends into data extraction. There may be process where this there's a, a certain amount of exploring the topic, understanding the topic, communicating those areas of uncertainty, either extending or narrowing or searching. And quite often this actually isn't documented, but this is an unusual paper, this paper by Sagar and Piston, which is a lovely paper, which talks about the, the interplay of these informalities. Um, this was describing the process was where they were looking at educational interventions um, to reduce um, suicide. Um, 
And they talk in that about starting off with that that broad question um, and then how they narrowed it um, during the process of the review. Um, and, um, and that's a really nice paper. It's quite unusual to find a paper that describes that very iterative process. And um, a recent um, uh, uh, scoping review of, of mapping review um, methods ex uh, explored what um, authors describe the major challenges. And it's this large number of data, but it's also this complexity and the ambiguity around the search terms, which can make these particularly challenging types of processes. And in fact, in the rapid review that we did in COVID, um, we had exactly that where we um, worked very closely with our commissioners. We went back um, when we started a search and we found, for example, so we were looking at um, population screening and we found that a lot of the literature was looking at um, screening at borders. Um, so we spoke with our commissioners, that wasn't relevant. Um, we also, um, obviously there wasn't much data at the time about COVID, so looked at other um, pandemic planning um, context to see if there was anything that we could have learned and, and would be applicable. In this context, um, I think one thing that's quite useful, because question formulation is a really um, a critical part of the review process, not just in terms of establishing an understanding of what it is you're focusing on and shaping your um, search strategy and your inclusion and exclusion criteria. But I think in this context of rapid um, scoping reviews can be particularly helpful. Now, the, um, uh, the JBI methods group recommend the use of the populate the PCC population context concept um, because quite often the concept isn't a specific or isn't interventions um, it certainly won't be a specific intervention um, and it may not be limited to study design um, but it's also I think quite helpful to look at the range of other um, frameworks that might be useful so as you're in conversation with your with your knowledge users and your commissioners to be thinking, okay, what are the what might be some of the other things that we might be interested in that might help us put some limits around our question? It may be, and quite often you see this um, in rapid scoping reviews, is that a con the the context is limited to a particular um, geographical setting. So there's the the it may be that actually you you look at um, what what types of interventions, for example, um, have been done in, say, my own context, the UK context. And you might apply those kinds of limitations. And of course, those will be discussions that you have, not just with your commissioners, but also with your information specialists, and then be seeing if, if which of these you can apply to impose some limits so you reduce your search yield. So just some key recommendations at this point. Anticipate that there will be a lot of work at this stage. It's a particular challenge for these types of reviews um, and that the screening is going to be a large portion of your time. And make sure that you're always communicating um, those decisions with your commissioners. And this is a place where actually don't scrimp on your planning time. So I just wanted to look at some of the approaches. Um, there's a, a really lovely uh, piece of work by uh, Michelle ha Haby um, that looks at all of the range of different different rapid approaches that we might use in um she applies it to sort of systematic reviews but thinking about applying these um and always whenever you're looking at a rapid approach be thinking what is the balance to what extent is this in going to is it is it going to increase the speed significantly to justify what might be the increase increase in the risk of bias and error and one approach that we see often used um in in uh, scoping reviews is the use of, of a single reviewer screening or limited dual approach. Um, and again, coming back to if you're planning these types of review, it's really important to have an idea of how long um, something's going to take. Um, and there's th there's tremendous variation, of course, around each of these, and they're going to be influenced by the complexity of the review. Um, but it may well be that you can have a rough idea um, of how long 
some of these tasks going to take. Um, Barbara's written a, a scoping paper, which has just, just collected together some of the evidence that we have about how long these different stages might take. And quite often in our rapid review course, I ask, well, how long would you anticipate it would take you to screen, say, a thousand references? And most people who've undertaken reviews will have a sense of how long um, it it might take. And I don't think it's unreasonable to, if you've got 10,000 titles and abstracts to anticipate it taking sort of four to five weeks. Um, and that's with reviewers who've got an entire day um, and no other commitments during their week just to focus on it. Um, and of course, the reality is that most of the time you don't have that sort of level of resource. But when you're beginning to plan in a rapid context, being able to map out these different stages and anticipate um, planning in what sort of staff resource you have, how much time do they have, allows you to be able to get a sense of how long something is going to be able to, is going to take and therefore what decisions you might have to make um, to shorten that if you've got to deliver a view within a very tight time frame. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we often see is, is actually cutting out a second reviewer checking. Not only does it mean that you're taking out the time to, to resolve differences, but obviously reduces the, the, time, the resource cost as well. But we know, and I'm not I'm going to go through all of these, um, but we know from the evidence that actually um, these processes frequently um, lead to error. And in the context of a scoping review or a mapping review or evidence gap map, it may be that you decide actually we can afford to miss some. And this is, again is a conversation with your um, with your commissioners and being able to convey that, yes, we may miss some studies, but actually the overall picture will still be sound. We can we can we can we're happy to to take that risk. But there might be. And this is one of the dangers, I think, for for these types of reviews, when you're going to single reviewer screening, it may be that actually there isn't clarity around your um your criteria and without checking that it may be that um that actually something very um um a decision is made that's not clearly understood and actually it distorts your overall big picture um in too great a way the time where missing studies actually really matters is if you're undertaking and this is an evidence gap map um the interactive visual tables where the evidence is plotted onto them um, we undertook this work as a precursor um, um, to a systematic review. We used this work to identify where the systematic review needed to happen. And we used this search um, and the results of it and our screening um, as our uh, uh, those then formed the foundations. We took the RCTs from that that we'd identified and we used those in a systematic review. And here, missing studies would have really mattered. So the idea that... Um, of, of the risks that you take in missing studies um, will vary across the different types of, of um, review that you're doing. And again, being cognizant of that and planning that in. The recommended guidance um, in from the Cochrane Rapid Review Methods uh, group is that perhaps to, um, to think about dual and independent screening right at the beginning, and this is something certainly that helps avoid that situation I've described where you run the risk of misin a, a, a misinterpretation of some of your inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is approach that um, I've used in um, a couple of, of rapid uh, scoping reviews, which has actually been able to increase the team size that you have several reviewers. And this might be something that you can do um, and consider. Um, what I would say is that it requires quite a lot of management and making sure that you're consistent across all of your reviewers. Just a couple of tools to mention, Covidence um, and Epi Reviewer. Um, so these are, are tools that can be extremely valuable, particularly in the context of managing a team. And this is just a, a screenshot on one of the reviews I did. And you can see the, the number of people that were involved. This was producing an evidence and gap map but it allowed us to work with a large international group um, and to, to manage that um, using Epi Reviewer. I also I want to mention the uh, semi-automation because that is something that we're seeing um, 
just more and more literature around it. And there's a lovely paper by Ian Schmilt um, looking at the use of um, semi-automation study selection in called needles in giant haystacks. Um, and, and they were looking at the results from a massive um, um, scoping review that they were doing. And certainly um, there are possibilities of using semi-automation. Um, and these are ways that actually the, 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 rec the, the, the most likely includes, if you like, come like cream to the top of your list, uh, they're ranked and the likelihood of them meeting inclusion criteria. Just a note of caution, um, that quite often when we're looking at um, when we're scoping a topic or, or, or we're wanting to we're interested in those things that are the outliers, if you like, we're, we're wanting to explore how concepts might be used, for example. Um, and so sometimes actually something that's just being looking at things that, are, that, that the machine is learning to to pull up things that are most like the last thing. Actually, when you're trying to get that big picture, you may not necessarily want it just to bring up things exactly like the one before. You're wanting to get a breadth of it. So just these this these approaches may not always work quite so well. Uh, there's a list of the tools and of course, Confidence and Epi Review are available for free for Cochrane authors. And we can see that there are some real time savings um, that can be used, not maybe not always as great as you might think, um, but also that the, the 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 results that we're seeing they're not always consistently good across all types of reviews. Particularly, um, there may be very heterogeneous um, topics, and and it may not always work. So just to be cautious, they're not the answer to everything. The other thing in a rapid context to just become familiar with these technologies before using it rapid contexts are not a good time to learn how to use a new software. Consider the implications of missed studies for the review and discuss with the commissioner um, and then report how machine learning has been used um, in that review. And I just want to move on to thinking. So we've looked at we've looked at our question formulation, we've looked at screening, and I just want to think about um, the process of data extraction. Quite often it might be called charting or coding. And again, we see quite commonly the use of single reviewer data extraction um, or partial dual extraction. And we know from um, the evidence that single reviewer extraction is likely to result in, in errors. Um, we know too that sometimes using more experienced contractors, extractors po possibly can expedite the process in some ways. And we know that there's certain types of data that often um, there's more likely to be errors. So with this understanding, just going to think a little bit about how um, this applies in um, uh, in rapid um, scoping reviews. Within this breadth of, of approaches, we can see quite a lot of difference. And I showed you at the beginning this idea that there are some approaches, um, in particularly mapping reviews, um, where you might have a large number of, of studies included. And you'll some you'll see some um, scoping views which perhaps have have a, a have a have a smaller number, and the depth of data that is extracted may vary considerably. So um, it may be that you're that um, so one of the, the you you may be doing a view and you might be looking at well which, which country what study design and which country was that um, study uh, undertaken in so it might be quite easily extracted surface level. But you might be looking and interested in something that's more in depth. How is a concept used? Um, and obviously, the way that you design your data extraction um, will reflect those differences. So recognize that within um, this, within scoping reviews, you're going to have this wide range of different approaches um, to data extraction. One of the key differences when these type of approaches that generally you're not going to be doing quality of appraisal. Um, and also in these types of um, approaches, you're not going to be taking outcomes. But one of the things that has surprised me is even when you, you're extracting what you think is quite straightforward data, that errors can occur. So um, being very mindful that if you're going down to one single reviewer, that um, there is a high, high chance that there'll be miscoding or, or, or data that's um, missed. One of the things that um, is really critical in a rapid context is being 
sure to align uh, very carefully how much data you're extracting. Um, and I think of it in terms of quite often in terms of the buckets, particularly when we're thinking about evidence gap map, these types of approaches in, um, where actually you, you've created a coding tool you're expecting to allocate um, your as you're extracting directly into that particular coding category. And you want to, in a rapid context, minimize your number of buckets. You really want to make sure that the data you're extracting is, is critically important for addressing the questions and the objectives of that review. And then equally important um, is to test it and make sure that there's good understanding. Um, and here's just an example of a data extraction tool. This is one I've created in Epi Reviewer. This is a review that we were looking at the impact of of air pollution on on children's um, health and so creating the categories um, so when I was talking about buckets I was referring to this but bear in mind that these types of data extraction tools may be quite different and you may be extracting text-based da data just a, a, a new little tool again this is available in epi reviewer that um, I think it's quite nice. It's a clustering facility. So quite often when you're beginning to um, think about to perhaps explore how you might create categories um, to frame your 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 data extraction, it it uh, so this was just um some data on internet generational interventions and it and 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 it will automate it, it will create these clusters for you. That's just quite a nice little tool that I ha I I've experimented with but haven't actually applied. But something that could be quite useful, certainly in a rapid context where you're discussing with your commissioners what sort of framework you might want either for extracting your data or for reporting. So just some key recommendations: limit your data extraction. Um, to those most that are the most important data fields. And of course, that does have impact for the generalizability of your finding. And just some uh, and ensuring that continue engagement um, with your commissioner. Um, so it's so so you don't get to the end and discover actually, uh, for example, they're interested in health service use as one of their outcomes, but they wanted you to separate primary and secondary use, for example, and you've got to the end and, and haven't done that. So that early and regular dialogue. And just finally, just to the just a quick thought about findings, because this is reporting findings. This is again an area where these types of approaches um, in a scoping review, um, your presentation of your findings may look quite different. Um, a lot of description of your of, of perhaps quite a lot of data, and if you're again going to be using software to present visuals working carefully, making sure that you have the skills within your team for that. Um, these are just um, some visuals. Um, so Danielle Pollock's written a nice paper looking at some of the visuals that might be used in scoping reviews. Quite often you'll see a, a global visual like this, um, often graphs. So just making sure that you have anticipated the types of, of, of um, graphics that you might want to use and um, that you collect the data that's going to support that. You collect it in a way that makes that easy and that you've uh, got some idea before you start um, the process of what you want to create. These are just some um, tools that might be able to support you. So to conclude, scoping, mapping reviews and EGMs are not quicker than other types of evidence synthesis. Do expect them take as long, if not longer than a full standard systematic review looking at effectiveness that time spent on question formulation may actually save time later. So be careful not to scrimp that. That's going to really have a big impact on um, this, the search results. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate with your commissioners all the way through. Um, and make sure that the methods you use are clearly communicated so that actually the, the impact of those methods on the generalizability and the trustworthiness of your findings can be clearly communicated.